Mr. Hugh Caperton, people want to hear from you. Uh -huh. Thank you, Gary. Well, first of all, I want to thank Justice at Stake and, and the Committee for Economic Development for having me participate on such a distinguished panel today. It's, it's really quite an honor for me to be here. Imagine that for nine years you've been involved in a court battle with one of the nation's largest coal companies whose fraudulent acts and tortious interference led to the, to the destruction of your company. After nine years of delays, motions, pretrial hearings, depositions, and a trial that lasted over seven weeks, you are finally sitting in front of the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals, hoping that after all these years, justice will finally be served. Imagine looking up and sitting on that bench is a justice that has been the beneficiary of one individual's $3 million spending spree in his election just a few years before. That individual was the CEO of the coal company you've battled for those nine years. During the hearing, that justice never asks a question. He never says a word. When it comes time for oral arguments, your attorney stands and starts to speak. And as he does, another of the justice, justices rises from his chair and proceeds to leave the bench. He will not return to the bench until your attorneys have concluded their arguments. Later that night, that justice and the CEO exchange personal emails. Three months later, pictures are made public of these two gentlemen vacationing together on the French Riviera while your case was pending before the court. This scenario is exactly what happened to me, and I'm here to tell you today that the feeling for me on that day can only be described in one word, sickening. It is a feeling that no citizen should ever have to endure in this country or a court in this country. I waited nine years to have my case heard before the West Virginia Supreme Court. And before my attorneys even stood up to make their oral argument, I knew that two of the five justices had already made up their minds. The actions of Chief Justice Robin Davis that day made it clear where the third vote would come from. She completely ignored the briefs that had been filed by the parties and instead focused on forum selection, an issue so critical to the appellee's argument that they devoted one entire sentence to the subject in their 90-page brief. Although bitterly disappointed, none of us were surprised when the court overturned the jury award by a three-to-two margin. The two justices I spoke of made up two-thirds of the majority, with Chief Justice Davis making up the other third. Although Justice Brent Benjamin's failure to recuse himself ultimately led to Caperton v. Massey becoming a landmark decision that forever changed the way campaign contributions will affect judicial recusals, it had little or no bearing on the outcome of my case. And why is that? Because the damage to the West Virginia court had already been done. There could be no fair trial in a fair tribunal because the buying of a Supreme Court seat by Don Blankenship, the CEO of the appellee, and his whining and dining of Justice Spike Maynard had rendered useless the ability of the court to act in any way that resembled a fair tribunal. And it all started when big money was introduced into Justice Benjamin's campaign by one of the super spenders mentioned in the New Politics Report. Well, let's be clear. Don Blankenship did not spend $3 million of his own money because he wanted a fair and balanced court. He did it to influence a vote that ultimately led to his company essentially being granted a $50 million get out of jail free card. Without the influx of super spender money into the Benjamin election, the outcome of this case almost certainly would have been different. This is what makes the issue of big money influencing judicial elections so difficult for the ordinary citizen. It appears that justice is indeed for sale. I'm here today not because I'm a legal scholar nor one of the leading appellate attorneys in the country. I'm here because I'm a citizen that has experienced firsthand the devastation and destruction that big money campaign donations are causing in judicial elections and ultimately in our courts. It is absolutely imperative that we do everything we can to eliminate special interest financing of judicial elections so that citizens will regain confidence in our judicial system. Thank you.